time, we're going to look at some more examples of monads. In fact, we're going to carry on with the example we had before of the monad for monoids and actually look at why it satisfies these axioms. After that, we'll have a look at another example, which is the monad for categories, technically small categories, because that's very closely related to this one and is another key example. So remember that the definition for a monad was that we had a functor on a category C together with natural transformations, eta and mu, the unit and the multiplication, satisfying these two diagrams here. And we said that the monad for monoids was this one here, where we're working in sets and we've taken the action of the functor to take a set x to the set of words in elements of x. So it remains to be seen what on earth these axioms are saying. And remember that they're not talking about the unit and the associativity of the monoid. That has somehow been encoded into the definition of T already. So let's leave these diagrams here and have a look at what they're saying. Right. So this one here is saying start with start with an element of X star. What's an element of X star? It's a word. So we're going to start with a word. Let's pick A comma B, comma C, for example. Now here we're going to do T of eta. Remember, eta says take a letter, A, and turn it into a word, the very boring word of length one. So what we're going to do here is we're going to turn each of these letters into a boring word of length one. So this is going to go via T of eta to the word of words, where each of the little words is just a word of length one. And when we do mu, remember mu just says remove the inner brackets. So we do mu here, and it says remove the inner brackets. So this is an exercise in futility, because what we've done is we've inserted some brackets, and then we've removed them again. And it's no surprise to discover that that is exactly the same as just sitting there doing nothing whatsoever. What about the other side? Well, we're also are going to start with a word. So I'm going to do it down here. This is the right-hand side over here, which is that you start with a word A, B, C, as before. But now we're going to do eta T of X, which means take this word and turn it into a word of words of length one, which means that we're going to send this by eta T, eta X, T of X, that's the double T of eta of X, to a word of words of length one. And essentially what that means is that you've, asset, uh, you've inserted brackets in a boring place, but in the sort of other possible boring place. Here we have brackets around each letter, here we've got an extra set of brackets around the word. And now when we do mu on that, well, remember mu says remove the inner bracket. So it's another exercise in futility. Slightly different kind of futility. There's more than one way of being futile. But again, if you insert brackets and remove them again, it's just exactly the same as having done nothing at all. So this one, this the unit axioms say, if you insert brackets and remove them, it's just the same as if you've done nothing at all. And that's nothing to do with the unit of a monoid. OK, so what about the associativity square? T cubed of x is where we start. T cubed of x is words of words of words of x. I'm not probably going to write, try and write one of those down. I'm just going to wave my arms around a bit. So this is words of words of words of x. Now what's mu? Remember mu is concatenation, which is removing brackets. Here we've got two kinds of brackets. We've got two layers of brackets that we can remove. Mu over here is telling us to remove one set of brackets whereas t of mu is telling us to remove some other set of brackets. So this one is telling us to remove the outer set, and this one is telling us to remove the inner set out of the two inner sets of brackets. But then the mu here tells us to remove the remaining set of brackets. So what this is saying, it's like having blue brackets and red brackets. And it says that if you remove the blue ones and then the red ones, it's exactly the same as removing the red ones and then the blue ones. So nothing interesting is happening there. So that's what the associativity square is saying. And that's why the monad for monoids is, in fact, a monad, which is a good thing, otherwise it would be stupid to call it the monad for monoids. We can also do this for small categories. Yes, there is a monad for small categories. So the next example is the monad for small Categories. Now, what category are we working in here for our monad? C is going to be the category of graphs. What's a graph? Well, a graph consists of a set C1 and a set C0 together with 
functions which are called S and T, because for us, of course, this is the set of morphisms, and this is going to be the set of objects, and this is telling us that every morphism has a source and a target. So that's an object of graph, and the morphisms in graph are the obvious kinds of commutative diagrams. So now, T takes the free category on this graph, uh, forms the free category on a graph. So how do you make the free category on a graph? Well, it's just like making the free monoid, except you've got to be a bit careful about source, sources and targets matching up. Because when we made words in letters, you just got letters and you just stick them in a line. Whereas when you're taking when you're taking arrows, you can't stick any old arrows in a line. You've got to stick composable arrows in a line. So the free category on a graph, I'm going to write like this. If you have some, some if you have a graph with some arrows. It might not be a category yet. You have to define composition. I'm going to have some water. So the objects don't change because you don't have composition on objects. But for the arrows, you need to make composites freely. So this is the same as the objects. But C1 star is the set of composable strings. Uh, of arrows. Now, we could write that down very pedantically, but let's just draw a picture instead. So where before, before we had you know, lists like A, B, C, now we're going to have things like F1, F2, F3, where these match up at their objects. You can, of course, have something that's like the empty list, because if this is going to be a free category, it jolly well ought to have an identity. So another example of something in C1 star, this is something in C1 star, and another example of something in C1 star is the identity. We've got to stick something in that's the identity, but it's better to think of it as the empty, the sort of empty composable string, so that when you stick it onto an arrow, nothing else happens to it. Just like if you stick an empty list onto the end of a list, it doesn't change the list, which is why it's an identity. So this is still a graph, because when you stick some arrows in a row to make a composable string, it still has a source and target. So the source and target of this one are A and D. And, well, and nothing really. There's nothing much else to say about this. In the one object case, of course, it just goes back to being a monolith, because a monolith is a one object category. But that's a bit of a digression. The fact that the axioms hold is exactly the same as the reason that they did for monoids. And so we have a nice monad here for categories. Now, just like with monoids, secretly I can tell you that the algebras for this monad are small categories. And next time, we'll have a look at what an algebra for a monad is and what information is encoded in it.